Now, I don't have a funny slide uh, like everyone else, so I'm just going to jump right into the course assessment. So, quick question. Um, normally, we break uh, in, in about 15 minutes. Um, we can either continue with course assessment and just power through, because actually we're getting – this session is not going to go four hours, surprisingly. I thought it might, but it's not. So we can either take a break now or we can just keep going and end and early. I'll just pause there and see if people have preferences. Ending early is good. Ending early. early. Okay, let's keep going then. Thank you. So I'm going to spend the next about uh, 15 minutes talking about concepts um, related to the following user stories within course assessment. As an instructor, I will submit grades for the university so the university can record students' level of mastery of the coursework. As a grader, I will assign grades for the activity offerings for which I have grading responsibility. And finally, as a central administrator, I will configure the grading environment so grades will be recorded appropriately when required. So what grades are we talking about here? I, uh, in Quality Student, we will be supporting uh, standard letter grades A, B, C, D, and F, but we also recognize the need to support other grading scales, um, for instance, pass or fail, uh, numeric, and um, it, the list can go on beyond that. Uh, we'll leave it up to the institutions to define the um, qu quantitative grading scales uh, for us to use and at their own, uh, so it'll be configurable. There's also, we've also heard of uh, needs for qualitative grading, but uh, that will need to, that will require further exploration. And at the end of the day, there will be some conversions made between these different scales within the institution for uh, learning result calculations. Now these grades uh, are, you know, posted and awarded as credit uh, when the final grades are collected, but there's also need um, for um, a midterm grade. We've heard of that. Um, and the purpose for these midterm grades are a little bit different from final grades. Um, they might not be tran uh, posted to the transcript. And the, more importantly, they will be uh, more of a early warning system for the progress of the students so that maybe other administrators or advisors can be alerted about a student's progress through the course. Now, the, we're going to use the grade roster concept as the primary mode for um, uh, collecting grades. Now, on a grade roster, it will be configurable, but we anticipate a need for all the students to be listed. Um, all the students enrolled in a specific activity offering to be listed in the grade roster. And we also recognize that certain activity offerings might have 100 or 200 students, so we will not be requiring all grades to be inputted before submitting. We will allow for a partial list of students to be saved. So your work in progress uh, for any, um, anyone inputting grades can be saved. We also know that instructors are busy not with just teaching, but also research and such, so they might be delegating some of that work. And so we will be building in support for a delegation to teachers, TAs, uh, or graders. And those rights can be tweaked and configured as uh, necessary by the institution. Next, I want to note that uh, currently the thinking is that uh, Quali Student will not be a learning management system. Uh, there are other systems to handle that. Um, we will not be tracking course assignment grades. We will not be tracking, we will not be a document repository. We will not track attendance and such, but there will be support for um, an interface or import export to the learning management between the learning management system and quality student. Uh, next comps I want to cover are grading periods. Uh, these are the four grading periods uh, we have identified here, but um, 
a lot of times these will be configurable. For instance, uh, well, in the beginning we'll have the midterm grades, and, and then we'll have the when the grading period opens. Um, grading periods close, but for some institutions, grades will be posted at the same time. We recognize that, so that will be configurable. And after uh, grading periods are locked, gra grades are locked in, uh, grade change progress or process will be required so that uh, approval uh, will be required by maybe an administrator. As I mentioned, uh, as I went through the different uh, concepts, um, I mentioned a word configurable. And I just want to sum it up here by saying that um, who can assign grades is configurable, who can change grades is configurable, as well as who can view grades. I think they're, um, those are great things that uh, we will allow institutions to modify as they need. And of course, setting up the grade scales, we will allow flexibility for institutions to define their own grade scales and uh, apply them to the different courses. Um, configuring the roster is also available, so the different attributes that's necessary to be viewed uh, will be, can be configurable. And of course, as I mentioned, the grading periods are configurable. I have a question. And next, sure. Um, we have a concept of approving grades here not because they're late, but just there's an informal approval process. Is there some milestone for that? Like you've got the grading periods? Those, um, yes, we're <laughs> we are well aware of this interesting um, grade approval process that University of Toronto has. Um, we're actually looking into sort of the line in the sand we've drawn for E1s for the first release of enrollment is that we're not using workflow, but we think we can accommodate your requirement via authorization. And in terms of grading milestones, those are, those are configurable by institutions as well. So whatever milestones you need to define, like if you had grades due by faculty, you know, approval due by departments, you can add those in. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yep. One other quick question on grading. Um, actually, two questions. One is, it appears in the screenshots, but can you confirm, will the grading support plus and minus values in grades? And secondly, will, the, will there be the ability to submit grades via blind grading, which is a common practice among law graduate schools? The answer to your first question is yes. Um, that's just how, whatever grading scales you want to define will be um, possible. In terms of the blind grading, I think that the, the answer is not yet, certainly not for E1. Um, we did a lot of requirements gathering around law school and um, to some extent med school, so we recognize they have like very different grading processes. Um, I think honestly that's not going to be, that's not going to be the first release of enrollment. It, it, um, because of the blind grading and the curves and all that. So it's coming, but not in the first release. Does anybody else on the requirements team want to say something about that? I agree. <laughs> I think it seems so edge that it definitely is an E1, and then it's, I think, still an arguable point in resources for E2. It's very edge. If there are no more questions, I'm going to pass it on to Christina so we can take a look at a prototype of a grade roster. Okay, so this is, if you follow that link, you'll get here, the course assessment. There's a very simple screen flow. And then the um, enrollment home, this is where the, the instructor or the grader, whoever's coming in to do this grading, would, would see their courses be able to click on chemistry and see these are all the students in their classes and they need to assign grades to them. So here, one of the, the concepts that Mike mentioned was one that you could save your grades for a, to finish them at a later date. So after clicking save, the person could go away, come back, and still have those three grades so they wouldn't have to enter them again. They can also partially submit those if they need to. So they could just submit those first three grades 
and then still need to submit to do the rest of them later. Once they submit all of them, then all their, their grading is complete. And at this point, this is where, um, well, depending on how the school configured it, at this point, changing these grades might require different authorization or a different, um, a different process to change something that has been submitted or potentially with um, different milestones um, if they haven't been approved yet or some other concept. But that is very simply what happens with, with the grading. And as Mike was saying, what would be available in, the, in what you could assign as a grade would be totally configurable based on what kind of grading scale you want to use. Um, that's not it. There's one other thing. This is an aspirational thing, not something that I think we're necessarily going to be doing, but the idea that you could add a note to your two different things. We wanted it to show very quickly that you could see notes available for each one of the students. So while you're doing the grading, that might be something that's relevant. Um, and I think that's everything for, for this grading. I don't know if there's any questions on this. It's pretty straightforward. But if there are any, if there aren't any, I'll pass it back over. A quick question from Berkeley. So, um, so we have kind of an, and other places may have an automated um, calculation for pass, not pass. Is that something that's part of? And is, that, is that, I think that that's what Mike was addressing with the idea that, that certain, that depending on how the grade is, what kind of scale you wanted to use, the grade could be entered and there'd be a calculation on the back end to show whether that was pass, not pass, or if, if this was if this was a pass not pass class, then that that might be the grading scale that you're using here, and so the the things in the drop down would be pass or not pass, rather than the grades and incomplete, or maybe it's still have an incomplete with a pass not pass, but but rather than the grades, you'd have that pass not pass. Great, thank you. I think also, Walter, this is Kathy, we have the concept that the entered grade from the grading perspective may not be the actual um, official grade, and that whatever a translation or a calculation is, there is certainly a, a room for that to happen. Okay, great. Thanks. No problem. Is there any uh, thought of being able to batch load grades? like from an LMS? Or from a text file? Yeah, yeah, I think we absolutely, we're going to have to import those. Those would come in as, as sort of unofficial grades. They would still need to go through some process to be finalized and submitted. Thank you. Okay. Um, stop sharing. Uh, can someone pick up and to show the last two slides? Cool. Uh, oh, another question while we're waiting. <laughs> um, I think the answer that was given about the pass-fail question was that it would be some sort of a configuration thing on the grading scheme, but I think what we have sometimes is there's a particular course or a particular student circumstance where they have a higher threshold that they're expected to meet. And so there needs to be the ability to record, was this a pass or was this a fail, separate from what the grading scheme would otherwise indicate. So two separate. I guess I'm confused. Are you, are you keeping track of those separately? Is it an exception for a student? Because I, I think what I was... What we have got in mind is that you would enter, say, a you know, a 60 is the grade. Again, I'm making this up. Whatever the grade is. And then if that translates to a pass or fail, that that is a calculation we've accounted for. The question is, it, it, so for, for everybody else in the class who didn't have this special circumstance, anything over 50 is a pass. But for somebody who's in a particular circumstance, it's sort of like an exception or something that well, your threshold for this course is actually 60. And my, my guess is, and the way we've been thinking about it, is if it's, if it's truly an exception, we should track it as an exception. If it's truly for this one individual. Um, 
I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you, Kathy. Or, or people in a particular program, a particular academic circumstance. It's not an exception that you would want to have to do on a one-off thing. It's sort of a rule that you want to put in place and tie to a pocket. Yeah, so I, I think I can't wait. So we have, the, we have the situation where if you have graduate students taking, say, medical school classes, they have a different grading scale than, than medical students in that same class or, you know, vice versa. If you have medical students taking graduate-level courses, they still get assessed via a different scale. So I think as long as the scale is defined and, and there's, and there's um, clear rules about when to apply which scale, we can accommodate that. But if it's a very sort of one-off type of thing, like for some reason Carol needs to be held to a different standard, um, then it would be an exception. But if there are like predictable rules based on populations, I think we can accommodate that. Is that what you're asking about? I think that's, that makes sense. If we can tie the, the grading scale to a population. Yeah. And, yep. yeah. Okay, so let's do a couple slides on services, and, I, and then we can, you know, move to any other questions. Um, the, uh, I, again, I don't want to drag you down into the, the details here, um, but, but what I do want to point out here, the blue, again, are really the entities that are part of the grading service, so it's very straightforward. There's a grading roster, there's the actual entry that would have the grade, and then you can see there's a list of valid grades for the student uh, in that particular roster, in that, in that roster. Um, so that's kind of one piece of it. But you'll also notice that that grade roster is actually tied to the, the course offering and the activity offering up near the top. Um, and there's also, for the grade roster entry, there's actually, that's tied to the course registration for the individual student, meaning that the individual student's engagement with the course, that's where we're actually hanging that grade off of. And then if you keep going on all over to the left, that particular grade for that course registration is something that's defined, again, based on the, the student, uh, I'm sorry, based on the way the course was set up in the catalog over to the right, sorry, thanks for helping point, the results value group or whatever valid for that course. And then you can see all the way up at the top there's a course catalog. So go ahead and hit a click once. So, there we go. Okay, twice is good. Three times good. Okay, maybe I put them all in one. Anyway, so the point is that at the course catalog is where you're going to start to define what kind of grading scales are appropriate. That's typically part of the actual um, um, approval process of that course. Um, so that's going to actually have constrain when the course is offered what kind of options you have around grading. The next level that happens is, in some cases, there are additional student options, but those are going to be constrained by whatever the offer was. So that's kind of what that second arrow is. All the way down at the bottom, this is where I was trying to make the point that the system is actually going to calculate the administrative grade. In some cases, it may be the same thing. You put in an A, they get an A. In other cases, you may put in the A, they get a pass. So um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So this is getting even more cryptic, and this is really what's happening underneath the covers from a, a class one perspective. And, you know, you're welcome to read these. There's a roster. There's a roster entry. There's an um, actual uh, grade for the student. Um, and then you have these couple of different things that we're actually recording over on the right, these four things. There's a final grade assigned. There's a final grade that's been calculated. There's a learning. There's a, a final um, credit calculated. And then there's a final credit earned. So these pieces, go ahead and hit the, the click once for me. So the point of this is these really become, even the, the, now we've taken that grade, we've refined it, we've finalized it, the grade and the credits are really well, now we're going to start driving the academic record. From a class one level, this really is the same pile of entries and, um, and records for the students. This will lead us into, I don't know if it's the next one or the next one, but one of the next ones is going to be the academic record. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Super, back to you, Carol. Okay, so um, whoever is sharing, can you just step right up? Thanks. All right. Um, so similar 
to, if you can just click on supporting materials, that'll take us out to the wiki. So like with, with all these um, trainings, what we've done is on the wiki page for the training, if you scroll down to the bottom under supporting materials, you'll see, drum roll, some terminology and basic um, concepts. And then here are all the artifacts related to, um, that we currently have related to the three functional areas that we talked about today. So course offering, um, course registration, and course assessment. So you can look at our requirements. And for course offering, course registration, we also have data, which is something we may not have much of in, in the, it, uh, there's actually quite a bit in course offering. Um, I think we have some around people, but, but not as much for the, for the last module. So that'll be a new artifact for you guys to dig into. So the service of documentation, um, user stories, notes from our discussions around um, these different topics. So there's essentially links to everything that we have related to these three functional areas for your self-study. Um, I won't actually go out to any of these because you can, you can click on the links and find them yourself. Uh, the follow-up to this module will be next Thursday. Um, again, I just encourage you to throw whatever questions or comments or issues you have in the Google Doc, and we'll try to address them both in real time, you know, asynchronously, and we can talk about them next Thursday as well. Um, there is the evaluation, the link to the evaluation. As always, we appreciate your feedback on the evaluations. Um, we do look at those and try to make adjustments um, as appropriate. So uh, I think that's pretty much, if we go back to the slide deck, if we can go back to the slide deck. I think the last thing is just um, reminding you uh, in two weeks from today we'll have the fourth of the six modules, which is going to be around program and program offerings, and it'll follow sort of a very similar format, meaning we'll be looking at, well, how do you offer programs, which is a concept that's not it's not as, um, I think, crisp and clear as offering courses is to most of us. Um, so but we'll talk about what does it mean to offer a program and then enroll students in programs and assess student progress in programs. So um, it's a little bit more complicated when, once you start moving out to the program level and, and more involved. Um, so that's what we have December 14th. So I guess I'll just see if there are any last <laughs> questions, <laughs> like why do ghosts have clothes? <laughs> yeah, there's a builder for every situation. <laughs> um, so I, I will go on mute because I know I'm causing some echo here, but we'll see if anybody has any last questions. This is uh, U of T again, Dan speaking. Um, I'm thinking about the scheduling, the link to scheduling packages, and um, would there be, do you envisage the ability to up, batch upload scheduling information? You can, can okay. Yeah, you can, I mean, my, my short answer is, oh, yes, <laughs> but I'll let Kathy, you want to take that one? You mean upload what kind of scheduling information and to where? Uh, into Kuali from my scheduling system, which decides when and where everything's taking place, and for that matter, often which enrollments the students should have. Okay, you threw me on the which enrollments. <laughs> Obviously, there needs to be a connection. The, the, the record, um, the record system of record for space information, again, is that that probably is going to be the scheduler, but we actually have a separate service for that, allowing that to be either the scheduler or it could be some kind of facility system. In terms of the um, actual, again, what happens is the request gets all built on the student side, those requests get sent over to the scheduler, and the scheduler is going to send back the answer. Um, the for the student being in the scheduler, I don't understand that at all. Does anyone, I mean, can you, I'm not sure what that means. I, I, was, I was with you, Kathy. I was, I was following and saying yes, yes, um, regarding the upload from the scheduling until you said what enrollment the student needs to have. Can you say more about that? I didn't follow that part either. Sure. Um, in engineering, we um, pre-register all of our students. They basically say what courses they want, and then we build out how many 
sections, how many activities uh, we're going to be offering based on that demand, and we schedule those things based on which students should be in which of those activities so we can actually deliver a, as much of a conflict-free schedule as possible, and then we upload the end results of that into our current student system. We'd be looking to do the same thing into Kuali. Um, actually outside of the general scheduling process? I, I think that at Berkeley, I think I, ophthalmology does that as well. It's like a, it's like a completely separate system? Yeah, it's a completely separate scheduling system that then we upload the results into the into quality, and then there's always students can go in and do things afterwards um, right. using everything you've discussed. But as a starting point, we pre-schedule not only the courses but also which students are going into which activities, and we upload you know 20,000 course enrollments in batch. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that makes sense. I think we need to get it on the radar. Whether that's an E1 thing or not, I have no idea. So I, I, th I think I understand it. Again, I, I, I know there's at least one use case at Berkeley. There, there may be others. Um, we're, and we're in the middle of figuring this out and, you know, starting on our two-year development cycle on, an, on you know, enrollment. Um, there's still some fuzziness for me on w as things change, who actually becomes the keeper of that actual final scheduled information. So I would say that's an area that we're still working on. So for instance, if there's a, a one main scheduling system that's got everything but your engineering group and then this other system that has the engineering group and tweaks start happening, do those need to get sent back to the engineering? I, I, again, I, I don't mean we have to have a big conversation now. I'm just saying there's more to unpack there for us to, to get to the right um, handshake. Absolutely. Yeah, and that, uh, that, that sounds very council. Yeah, council <laughs> council deprioritized that particular identified feature into not E1, and I think not even E2. But that's a you know an area still being played with what's an E2 and what's not an E2. Thanks, Dan. I was actually just looking through the worksheet to try to find that. <laughs> And, you know, this is also why we have a you know, contribution from the community and finding a couple of institutions that need that feature, specking it out, and, you know, and, and contributing to the, to the collective that we, you know, know as quality students. That could be a great opportunity. Good plug. <laughs> um, well, wow, I just thought, I thought that this would be, I thought we would get a whole four hours on this because there's so much content, but maybe I think it's just something we're, we're all more familiar with than some of the other areas. Um, I'll attribute it to that. Or just yeah. general training fatigue. <laughs> um, so, unless, I, are there any other questions? I mean, we have the time and we're happy to take them. Question. Otherwise, we'll, we'll close the session out. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you all very much for attending. Um, again, we have a follow-up session next Thursday to um, review the materials between now and then and questions come up for you. Um, we can deal with them then. And then we'll see you in two weeks for program and program offering. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Carol. Bye.